Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. As of this week, more than 14,000 nursing home residents have died from COVID-19 in New York. And we only know that because the state was forced to publish the true death toll earlier this year. That was after the state AG's office said there were more deaths than the state was telling us. That was under former Governor Andrew Cuomo, whose administration chose to leave out nursing home residents who died outside those facilities, like in a hospital. And since then, we've learned that thousands more nursing home residents died from the virus than we knew. For his part, Cuomo has said he left out those deaths because they were already included in the overall number. But families of nursing home residents didn't buy it. And a lot of them are still mad about that and other decisions made during the pandemic. Some have said that thousands of deaths could have been prevented if the state had listened to their concerns from the start. And for the first time this week, those families got an apology from the state. Governor Kathy Hochul spoke with a few of them in New York City in a meeting she said was long overdue. It was very emotional. It's hard to describe what went on, but that's, I work with elected officials. You know, they can disagree with me one day, another day they might agree with me. I just approach this whole thing differently, that people deserve to know that their government listens and actually cares, gives a damn about them. And that appears to be part of her new strategy, trying to shine more light on state government. But the big question is, will it last? Let's talk about that and more with Michael Gormley from Newsday and Anna Gronwald from Politico. Thank you both for being here. Sure, Thank thanks, Dan. Uh, it, it's a very good point. It, it, Governor Hochul has said that she wants to make uh, transparency a cornerstone of her administration, which is terrific. But as, as you guys both know, politicians, when they first get into office, are very transparent because mm -hmm. usually they're revealing stuff from the previous guy. <laughs> right. So we'll see what happens as we get into the budget. I mean, I'm hopeful. Um, it's good for everyone if, if it is more transparent. And she certainly made a commitment. So we'll, we'll just have to watch and see how it goes. Yeah, we, we can't forget how Andrew Cuomo, when he came into office in 2011, was like framing himself as the king of transparency. And then they had the ethics deal uh, the same year or the the year after the where Jacob was formed yeah. and everybody was like, oh my gosh, Jacob, so great. <laughs> and now here we are 10 years later where everybody's like, you know, Jacob is stuck to the bottom of my shoe. <laughs> <laughs> Anna, what do you think about this transparency thing with the governor? It, it, she's been in office, um, we're talking Friday, she's been in office 52 days as of now. Well, I, I agree with Mike. I think that there's a very um, there's a very smart political move to say this is going to be so open, especially after um, what happened to her predecessor. That was a huge criticism. But I, I don't think that Kathy Hochul or her people are necessarily interested or um, used to, accustomed to people criticizing them. Yes. The lieutenant governor's job is not to uh, take all the hits. And so I think that an instinctual reaction would be to um, not necessarily hide, but to hold off, not tell everyone everything right away, because that's a really difficult thing to do just a couple months into office. You know, there is a part of transparency that the public doesn't quite know too much about. It's the FOIL process, freedom of information law. Um, Mike, I just want to pose this question to you because you know, how has FOIL been for the state in the past 10 years as a reporter trying to get these requests? Can you describe what it's been like? Well, ideally, under the freedom of information law, you get your information, you get five days, you get notified, you put in a formal request for information, public information, things like salaries, um, spending, you know, basic stuff that the public should need to know. Um, you get, they have five days to tell you if you're gonna, they're gonna provide it or not, and then maybe a month, ideally, they provide the information. I, just, it's interesting, yesterday I got a notice that a, a foil that I had put in for in uh, December of last year will now be at least, will take at least until November. So that's where we are at this point. And over the years, it's gotten worse. And that's actually part of a situation. It, there's a trend in politics now where transparency is, you, you give a lot of lip service to transparency, but governments are becoming more tightly run now because they're always running for re-election or election. So there's a much more tighter control on information. And you saw this with uh, the Trump administration in Washington. You saw it with the Cuomo administration in Albany. Mm -hmm. it, there's a real trend there. You know, I foiled uh, in September, early September, and I foiled for, I won't tell you what it is, but I foiled for just a set of emails. Very, very simple. And it's been now almost two months. And I have to wonder, 
maybe they just haven't gotten the new procedure in place, which I imagine is going to be a tough haul for them to really revamp an administration that, or I guess a former administration that was really held everything very close to their chest. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to move on to the religious exemption case in, in the state. So this week, a judge issued a preliminary injunction, which basically means that healthcare workers in New York are allowed to seek religious exemptions. exemptions. That doesn't mean that they'll be approved automatically, of course, but they now have that option. Anna, what does this mean for the Hochul administration? It's another legal setback for them. I don't think they've had too many. It's only been 52 days, but what does this look like for them? Well, I think that it's going to be, from my understanding, a, um, a example of what could happen across the country. And so a lot of people are very closely watching. That's got to make them a little bit nervous. Um, but I don't think Hochul has indicated that she is interested in backing down. And she did say that she would appeal. Um, so far, she has been pushing this as um, a cornerstone of her first few months in office of getting everyone vaccinated. And um, she has not indicated, nor has her staff, that this is something that they are willing to cut back on a little bit. The, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which is a federal appellate court, um, the middle tier between the trial level and the U.S. Supreme Court, is hearing a related case in New York right now. And I'm really interested to see if that case makes it to the Supreme Court because the last time the Supreme Court made a major, major ruling on vaccines like this was uh, in the early 1900s, and I won't get into the whole thing about what's happening. You know here. far too much about it. Uh, Actually, please do. Uh, how would you just say that Anna's right on target here? This, the country is watching this case. Yeah. It's very important. Um, the, the difficulty of this case, it, it almost, each side seems to think they have a slam dunk in this, and they don't. Governor Hochul's arguing that no religious leaders, from the Pope on down, as she puts it, um, call for people not to get vaccinated. They're all actually calling for people to get vaccinated. But the law, and you would know this better than I, the law really goes to an individual's commitment. Right. And that's, that's where the rub is. That's where the difficulty is of this decision. Right. It's the balance between the right to my personal liberties, religious freedoms, balanced with the public health. The case in the early 1900s said, well, your <laughs> exemptions, they don't overpower public health. Like you can't claim your religion and then have somebody die. So we'll see where that goes. Let's move on to politics for a little bit. A poll came out this week, the first poll that we've seen ahead of next year's Democratic primary for governor. Really, really interesting stuff. Uh, they compared if Hochul runs compared to Attorney General Letitia James and New York City Public Advocate Jamani Williams and former Governor Andrew Cuomo. Um, and as, as you know, Hochul is getting a, a plurality of the vote. 44% would go to her. So uh, politically, what does it look like for Kathy Hochul going into next year? It, it seems based on this poll that she might just cruise to victory in a primary, but I imagine things could change in that time. Yeah, and I don't think that even encompasses all the candidates we probably will see jump into a primary. This yeah. is the first time in 10 years that Democrats have thought maybe they have a an open shot at trying for the governor's office. And um, I, I think it's important to note, though, that none of these people have jumped into the race yet. Kathy yes. Ogle is the only one who has declared. And so it's really easy to say, ah, let's reelect Kathy. But um, it could change very significantly if one or more of these candidates drop out. And they still have time to. They don't want to deal with all of this. <laughs> they, have, they have an out. So um, I think that the race will change a lot, but I think that will happen in the next couple months and things will get to solidify a little more. Yeah, I think Jumani has said, like, he's going on his exploratory core tour of running for governor, which to me indicates that he's going to announce probably. Obviously, that's still up in the air. Um, but if I was a Tish James and there was a lot of buzz about me running for governor and I saw this poll, I might think twice. Mike, what do you think? Yeah, well, this is what pollsters call a baseline poll. So this sets where we are and how things are going to change. That's the important thing is how it changes over this next few months. Um, right now, as Anna said, you don't have um, Williams or, or James announcing that they're going to run. That usually changes quite, things quite a bit for a candidate. But the other thing that's going on behind the scenes is think about the quandary for for the big contributors to campaigns right now. Yeah. They have to decide whether to put their money on Kathy Hochul, which may be just an investment for one year, yeah. um, or should they try to figure to gauge the system who, or, the, or the, the chances of a challenger winning. So everyone's going to be fighting for these campaign dollars. Um, that's going to actually be a different kind of element to this, to this campaign, unless Kathy Hochul can clear the field. And that's what she's trying to do now by getting county Democratic chairs to endorse her. It's so interesting because, as you said, they have to pick who's going to be the, the next elected governor. 
And if they don't want Kathy Hochul based on whatever, that could all change. But we do have to leave it there. Anna Gronwald from Politico and Mike Gormley from Newsday. Thank you both so much.